In this module, we're going to introduce the first major part of the course, which is modeling. In the previous example, where we were, where we were discussing different control architectures, we got a sense of, of why it, it is important to have a model. In particular, um, when we were trying to set the, the throttle level in order to achieve a, a certain level of speed, we saw, or we could imagine, how, how the throttle setting would be different based on whether or not we were trying to control a Ford Focus or whether or not we were trying to control a Ford Mustang. And so that gives some indication of why when we deal with controller design um, it's important to have a model. In general, a model is a physical abstraction of, it's an abstraction of the physical world. You can sort of imagine that uh, an automobile is a very complex uh, system if you as a human being tried to understand all aspects of it simultaneously, it would be rather overwhelming. And so the idea is to try and um, get rid of those elements of the, of the system that we don't need to see uh, in order to answer our, our in particular problem at hand, in order to, make, um, to limit the amount of information so that we can, we can address the, you know, the, the thing that we're trying to do at the, at the, at the moment. Models can be used for different purposes, um, possibly even before the physical system exists. This, again, is one of the sort of the motivations for a model-based approach to design. Uh, it's much easier to make a change when your design is just on paper than it is um, once something has actually been manufactured. Models can be obtained in different ways and the, the level of detail that you include in the model and the form of the model will depend on, on your purpose. In general, you want the model to be complex enough to answer your question, but, but no more than that. Um, these last three bullets, uh, I will go into more detail um, on the subsequent slides. So one approach for deriving a model is from first principles. In other words, from physical laws that govern the, the system, the physical system. You know, Newton's laws, F equals MA, or Kirchhoff's laws, things like that. This type of approach is nice in that it, it provides a lot of understanding. Um, you understand where all aspects of the model came from. You can then use empirical data to determine specific parameters in your model or to validate the, the accuracy of your model. An alternative approach for deriving models is from empirical data. In particular, you can feed a known input into the system and observe the output, and there, um, and there just try and fit a mathematical equation that matches the input to the output. So, for example, in this case, our system could maybe be a motor, and you could apply uh, a 5 volt input to it and observe how the speed of the motor changes, and then try and fit an equation that matches that voltage input to the, to the observed response of the motor speed. This approach is good for complicated systems in that you don't really have to understand the system. You know, you don't have to derive the model um, using your physical knowledge of the system, you just try and match the input to the output. Examples where this approach might be useful would be for an IC engine or for a battery. You, know, you can imagine the complexity uh, that would go into trying to model the, the combustion process, the chemical reaction that's happening uh, in each stage of the engine cycle. Or similarly, um, the electrochemistry, um, the chemical reaction that's happening in a in a battery, you could imagine the the complexity of being able to understand that at a at a minute level. It's also good for black box systems, you know, for systems that aren't really well governed by you know well defined physical laws. For example, a driver model. You could imagine um, that if a driver was given a warning, or if he saw an obstacle in in front of him. Uh, it would take him some time to to react, uh, you know, recognize the warning, recognize the obstacle, um, start to move, apply the brake, uh, etc. Um, to model that from first principles would be uh, basically impossible, you know, to to model the synapses firing and and the physiological response of the of the driver to 
you know, lengthen his leg and apply the brake. Rather, it's, it's much easier to sort of treat the driver as a black box, look at what the, the sort of stimulus was, look at the response, and just find a, an equation that, that matches the two. A drawback of this sort of approach is that it doesn't provide a lot of intuition. So you have a mathematical model you know, with these various parameters in it, a number five, for example, but you don't necessarily know what, what that number five represents. You don't know if it's a resistance, you don't know if it's, if it's a friction um, or whatever. And sometimes these empirically derived models um, aren't, can't be widely applied. So maybe that model would really fit um, or predict the, the output of your system or the response of your system very well for the particular input that, the, that was used for the derivation. But if you try to apply this model in a different set of circumstances, a different input, a different set of environmental conditions, maybe it wouldn't work very well. Uh, maybe your model is oversimplified. The level of detail that you include in your model depends on, on the purpose of the model. Um, it depends on are you using it for design or are you using it for analysis? Um, do you need it to be very accurate or do you just need to be in the ballpark, etc. And so here we have um, a DC motor and one example of a, of a model is this, this graphic here, uh, sort of a circuit diagram, a free body diagram. And then over here we have an equation that, that represents um, the motor. It may not look, look so at, at first glance, but um, this model is, is simplified, um, is, is a simple model, or a relatively simple model. Um, and the benefit of it is that it's simple enough that we can, we can solve it by hand. So we can generate a closed form solution of this. Or maybe we can't yet, but, but by the end of this class you will be able to solve this equation. And so, you know, I could say this is the voltage input to the motor and then you could solve this equation for that input and tell me exactly what the equation would be for this, for the speed response. And so, you know, having this closed form solution gives you a lot of intuition. You can look at the solution and see exactly how the different parameters affect the response. How does the resistance affect the response? How does the inertia of the motor affect the response? One, one limitation is that often in order to make the model simple enough to solve, to generate a closed form solution for, uh, you have to make simplifying assumptions and so it might not be as accurate. So let's take a look at this particular example and think about what sort of assumptions were made to, uh, to, simplify, to simplify the model. So one simplifying assumption is that uh, we've sort of lumped the parameters of the model. So if we look at this picture, this figure, we sort of have a, a resistor in series with an inductor. In reality, the, the motor itself doesn't, doesn't have a, a big in, a resistor inside of it in series with a big inductor. In reality, it has a, a long piece of wire that has properties distributed along the length of the wire. So, you know, the resistance is distributed across the whole wire, the inductance is distri distributed across the whole wire, but instead of modeling it in that way, we've sort of taken the entire property of the piece of wire and lumped it into one resistance and one inductance. Another simplifying assumption that we've made is the friction within the motor, we've modeled it as being, as being a linear function of the speed of the motor. And the advantage of that is that linear equations are, are easy to solve, or easier to solve. In reality, this, you know, the, the friction doesn't exactly behave like that. Um, it may be a function of the, um, the, the speed of the motor squared, or it may have some stiction in it. So um, it may initially stick uh, so you'll apply some torque and it won't move at first, um, but if you increase the, the voltage or the, you know, the torque being generated, it'll eventually break free of the stiction, and so that's not captured in this model. But adding those nonlinear elements would make, it, make the equation very difficult to solve. Another example of a nonlinearity that, that 
exists in the in the true motor is uh, that it saturates. Um, you know, all physical systems in reality have have some limit to them. This this motor can't generate an infinite speed or an infinite torque. At some point, it's going to saturate. Um, and again, so we've we've left that out of this model. Another example of a simplification is that we've assumed that all of the coefficients are time invariant. Um, we've assumed that the resistance is constant, that the friction is constant. When rea in reality, again, that's not always the case. Um, the resistance may change with the temperature of the motor. It may change um, with the age of the motor. Uh, the friction may change. You know, maybe you have some lubricating oil in there, and as the temperature changes, the viscosity of that oil changes. Um, so those are all simplifications that we make. That, that hurt the accuracy but make the, the model easier to use. If we were to include more of these um, you know, details, uh, you could imagine, so here we've got a, a block that's representing a motor, and so maybe the mo that model, you include the nonlinear friction, you include the, the time varying parameters, um, and then you start to couple it with other complicated models. Uh, so the engine or the battery, etc. So you could imagine that at this level, um, this is a much more accurate model, but it it would be impossible to solve by hand. Um, the only way that we could solve it is to numerically approximate a solution to the equations, and that is in in essence what simulation is. So so that's a an alternative approach. Um, you can get better accuracy, but it's maybe not as intuitive. Um, you can sort of do experiments on the system to see what the effects of various parameters are. Uh, change a parameter, change the input, um, and observe the output. But you don't, you don't have a closed form solution that explicitly shows the effect of each parameter. Looking at this for a second, can you think of any reason why you might not want to make the simulation model as detailed as possible? Is there any reason why you wouldn't want to include all, you know, the highest level of, um, of accuracy possible? Well, the reason that you wouldn't is because that it could make the, it could make the simulation take a very long time to run. Uh, you could uh, imagine a situation where um, maybe it takes 10 hours for the simulation to run one second of time. And so in that case, maybe the model is very accurate, but it's not very useful because it, it takes so long to run different test cases. Another thing that we're going to introduce is the idea of the difference between a static system and a dynamic system. And so this is sort of to go along again with models of different levels of complexity. So a static system, the output is determined only by the current input and it reacts instantaneously. So for example, if this is our system and I give it an input of 2, the output will change to 10 instantaneously and whenever I put a 2 into the system I will always get a 10 out. And so the relationship between the input and the output does not change, it's static. Every time I put in a 2, I always get out of 10. Furthermore, this rela relationship can be represented by an algebraic equation. So in this case, you could model the system as multiplication by 5. You put 2 in, the system multiplies that by 5 to get an output of 10. Some systems are well, well modeled by, by this sort of static model, but, but many aren't. So for example, let's think of of this as being a motor. And we apply 2 volts into the motor. In reality, the speed of the motor wouldn't instantaneously jump to, to 10 radians per second. It would take some time to sort of spin up. So a dynamic system or a dynamic model of a system, the output takes time to react. Furthermore, the relationship between the input and the output changes. Um, it's not always the same. If I put in 2 volts, the output um, isn't always 10. It, it depends on how long has that 2 volts been applied. It depends 
what was the speed of the motor before I applied the 10 volts? Was it at rest or was it already spinning? So the relationship between the, out, the input and the output changes, it's dynamic. Therefore, we can't represent the system by an algebraic equation. We need to represent it by a differential equation, meaning that it's, we need to represent it by an equation with derivatives. So let's take a look at uh, a motor from a, a, mo a model of a motor from a static viewpoint and from a dynamic viewpoint. And so one way to, to look at a model of a, of a motor is as a torque speed curve. And so if we look at this, um, we have some, some voltage input to the motor, EA1, and we have some load torque. We'll get some if we look at this table or if we look at this graph we get some corresponding speed. If we change the load we jump down to a different speed. Or if we change the voltage input to the motor from EA1 to EA2 we also get a different speed. And so this in essence is a static model you change the input, you change the conditions, the output changes instantaneously. It doesn't capture the dynamics. In reality, that's not how a motor works. In reality, if you change the load or you change the voltage input to the, to the motor, it will take time for the motor to react. And so in reality, we'll get something like this, where the, it takes time for the motor speed to, to ramp up or the the torque of the motor will take time to, to change. What then is this, this torque speed curve capturing? In reality, what it's capturing is it's sort of capturing the steady state behavior of the system. So for a given voltage and a given load torque, this is what the speed would be once the transients die out, once we sort of reach steady state. These two types of models are both valid. Um, it just sort of depends on what your what your goal is or what you, what you need from it. Uh, so the the torque speed curve, it's very simple. It's very easy to solve. You just look up the graph or look up a value in a table. Um, so it's very simple to solve, but you don't get you lose the transient behavior of the motor, which could be okay depending on your situation. So if you're just trying to perhaps size the motor and you want to know what the maximum speed is or the maximum torque is, this could be fine. Or if you're going to operate the motor in a, in, a, in a way that it doesn't, the conditions don't change very quickly, then, then a torque speed curve may be sufficient. But if you're interested in, in understanding these transients, you want to know how fast does the motor take to respond. Then, then you need this dynamic model, which will be more complicated, i.e. it will be a differential equation, which is harder to solve, but gives you more information. So this is a common trade-off that we, we will see between sort of usability of the, of the model, ease of use of the model, and, uh, and level of accuracy. To summarize what we've covered here in mo module two, uh, introducing the topic of modeling, we looked at a couple of different approaches to, to deriving models. One being from first principles using physical laws like F equals MA. Another being a black box approach where we feed a known input, observe the output, and try and match the two. And so we talked about sort of what some of the advantages and disadvantages of these two approaches are. You know, how much intuition do they provide? How easy are they to generate? Um, what do you need to know? How widely applicable are these types of models? We've also talked about the level of detail to include in a model. So the level of detail depends on what you need it for. Um, uh, what, what kind of questions are you trying to answer? Under what sort of conditions do you need the model to be accurate? What level of accuracy do you need? There's trade-offs between, you know, the complexity of the model and the accuracy. Uh, 
the speed with which a simulation could run, etc. And along these ideas of complexity trade-offs, we looked at what the difference between a, a static model is and a dynamic model is. Um, the level of accuracy that you get, um, does it capture the transient behavior, does it only capture the steady state behavior, um, how easy is it to use, is it an algebraic equation or a lookup table that's very easy to solve, or is it uh, a differential equation that's more challenging to solve.